Welcome to Super Talk Outdoors, where we celebrate every single Monday at lunchtime the world-class outdoors of the state of Mississippi because we are the capital of the outdoors in America. I want to thank you for joining us on the powerful Super Talk Mississippi radio network or on Super Talk TV at C Spire TV, or you might be watching the show on YouTube or Facebook or listening on your favorite podcast. It's March the 18th, 2024. Chronic wasting disease, CWD, has been spreading across the United States and unfortunately Mississippi as well. This matters because the impact to the deer family, of course, and of course, uh, it also matters because of our cher cherished deer hunting, not just in America, but, but certainly here in Mississippi. Um, also, unfortunately, we can't rule out that this won't be a human health issue at some point down the road, so we've got to pay close attention to it. CWD is actually in the same family as mad cow disease, so in that case, it actually did tran transfer to humans. Um, the global CWD story, though, has been developing for decades. Uh, the slow march of CWD across the U.S. and the fact that it has such a long incubation period makes it difficult to manage. It also makes it difficult to talk about, frankly. Um, it's also easier for naysayers to push alternative theories. That was certainly the case several years ago. Lots of confusion, lots of theories. Uh, that's somewhat less the case today, but you've really got to focus on the date of those videos when you watch a YouTube video, that's for sure. The more recent videos on the subject are the ones you really want to focus on. So more, recent, uh, so, so more recently, naysayers uh, are acknowledging that CWD does, in fact, exist. Uh, what you'll find when you do a deep dive into CWD in the United States is that there's a lot more discussion these days and, and some disagreement about how to actually go about managing the disease. It's, there's much less about whether CWD is actually a concern or not. How to keep the prevalence of the disease low as low as possible is where most of the focus is, and that's where some of the biggest debates are occurring in America. By the way, the word prevalence means that we, it, it's referring to the proportion of CWD within a population of deer in a Mississippi county at a specific time. That's the way we would look at it. But still, many hunters desperately want to believe, for example, that video that's being passed around probably as we speak with that expert, quote unquote, who says it's all about nutrition and that prions don't actually exist. Others want to buy into the theory that CWD has always been here and that it's merely survival of the fittest. Hey, I get it. It's only natural to want to find answers, especially with something as difficult and complicated as CWD. Naysayers come in so many different categories. Some are in the anti-government crowd. Some are deer breeders and people who are aligned with the deer breeders who know CWD stands in the way of transporting deer uh, pen to pen. So they muddy the waters with all these alternative theories. A lot of you listening now are like I was. You're, you're a big fan of Ted Nugent, for example. I, I, I love his show, Call of the Wild. I'm also a drummer, and he's a heck of a guitar player. I love what Ted stands for in terms of hunting. Uh, I, and I wanted to believe him. I really did. There are some others. Um, I wanted to believe them too. Frankly, CWD is, is, isn't easy to get your head around. So I started to pay a lot closer attention to CWD when I started this show a couple of years ago. But there is a growing body of accurate knowledge about CWD evolving for anyone who wants to do their homework. But you still have to sort through those misleading views that have been on the internet for years. And when it comes to finding the best responses to the disease, there's still a lot of different views and approaches, but there is there are some best practices that are emerging. And like I said, I went to school on CWD. I read a lot, I watch a lot of videos. And after studying, this is the way I would describe the goal for, for our state, to keep the prevalence of CWD as low as possible in Mississippi so that we can enjoy deer hunting for many years to come and buy some time for the science to catch up because we desperately need scientific solutions. I want you to think about CWD this, this way. It's sort of like a cancer spreading across the landscape. And like we don't have a cure for cancer, we don't have a cure for CWD. So we've got a lot of work yet to do. 
So how do we keep prevalence low? How do we keep it down? That's what today's show will ultimately be about. Uh, the name of the show today is CWD Unmask, Debunking Myths of, of Chronic Wasting Disease. And I am thrilled to have two guys with me who've been on the show many times before. William McKinley, who's the head of the DEER program for the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fishers, and Parks. And uh, my friend, Dr. Bronson Strickland, PhD from DEER University Podcast. He's also a St. John Family Endowed Professor of Wildlife Management at Mississippi State. And, and two guys I've really enjoyed getting to know over the years. William and Bronson, welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. How are you guys doing? Doing wonderful. Good to be here. Same, Ricky. Glad to be yeah, here. Yeah, it's good to see you guys. So, Bronson, give me the elevator speech on what you do. Uh, I guess the elevator speech is deer research and educational outreach based on research outcomes. So, we do things that we think are relevant scientifically for deer biology and management, and we work hand in hand with NBWFMP to answer their questions. And then we try to get that information into hunters and landowners' hands so they can use it. Good, good. And you've done some great work, man. I tell you, what I've enjoyed over the years paying close attention to Deer, your Deer University podcast, and it's just full of amazing information. Um, so great job and thanks for being here. William, give, give us your elevator speech. Well, first, I want to point at MSU and, and make note that this relationship between a university and the state agency and researching, especially white-tailed deer and all wildlife in Mississippi, one of the best relationships out there in the nation. And uh, we have all, we often have meetings together, but my job, 50,000 foot, I'm collecting data. I'm collecting data from population, from disease management standpoint, from multiple faucets from the deer herd in our state, trying to figure out how many we got and how best to manage them, Ricky. Yeah, well, it's good. Hey, listen, we're lucky. We're lucky to live in Mississippi, as you and I have talked many times before. You know, we're the capital of the outdoors for a re reason. Deer hunting in Mississippi is world class, isn't it, William? It is. It is. We're harvesting a lot of older age class bucks out there. We have a high, many of us might say a little too high, deer population. Uh, we've got a lot of opportunity and deer hunters, well, our latest survey showed that 92% of the people buying a hunting license in Mississippi are hunting white-tailed deer. Most of them, like Brunson and I, hunt something else also, but deer hunters are, they're, you know, they're driving the ship here. That It's really big in Mississippi, the pursuit of white-tailed deer. Yeah, there's there's no doubt. We're very lucky to hear, live here. And one of the main reasons I refer to Mississippi as the capital of the outdoors in America is because of that. Hey, so today we're going to try to dispel some myths and provide some accurate information, at least some of the latest information about CWD. But before we go any further, let me uh, let me ask Bronson, if he will, to kind of give us a definition of CWD and some of the impacts on the deer population. Yeah, well, it is uh, CWD, that is chronic wasting disease. Um, it is the deer version of mad cow disease. So it's a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. So that means that's bad. And that just means that is a transmissible disease uh, that, that is going to cause essentially holes in the brain. So it, it's going to affect the, uh, the motor skills, uh, the, the neuro neurological system of the deer, and ultimately, if it manifests long enough, death. And so it's in a class of those diseases, TSEs, mad cow disease, scrapie, et cetera. And so it's the deer version of that. Uh, William, anything to add? He described it well. Oh. Yeah, so, so, so Bronson, some people like to say, how do we know it's 100% fatal? Because, you know, deer die of other things. But, but how would you answer that? Well, every time a deer has been marked, and so there's been a lot of studies over decades now, and what we see, and whether it's research done in the north, whether it's research done in the west, is that the, the way we handle that is that CWD facilitates, promotes, and accelerates death. And so some people may say that, well, the deer died of another cause. 
like pneumonia. William can tell you firsthand our first case in Mississippi, the deer clinically died of pneumonia, but that was facilitated and promoted by CWD. And so in every single case, when you look at these survival or mortality curves, deer that have CWD die at a much faster rate. That's just a fact now. Okay, so look, th this is the end of the first segment. When we come back on the other side, uh, we're going to actually get into some of the myths and uh, misconceptions. Uh, I'm actually going to play a, a two-minute video from a podcast that Ted Nugent did. We're going to talk about Dr. James Kroll and and some of, of his contribution to this topic, and uh, and try, you know just kind of we're going to go right at it and and talk directly to. Uh, sort of where we are with our common knowledge as it relates to CWD. We'll see you with my friends, uh, Bronson Strickland and uh, William McKinley when we come back on the other side. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. We're having a detailed conversation about CWD, chronic wasting disease. We're going to we're going to try to you know, talk about some of the uh, myths that are out there. We're going to look back. We're going to talk about some of the current information. When we went to, uh, when we went to break, um, Dr. Bronson Strickland was talking about uh, how if a deer contracts CWD, um, I mean, if it, just, if it doesn't catch anything, get hit by a car, it's, it's ultimately going to die because it's 100% fatal because of what happens in the brain. But he also made the point that the first deer in Mississippi actually died of pneumonia. And, and William McKinley, who's head of the deer program for the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, wanted to add something to that. Go ahead. Go ahead on that, William. Yeah, Ricky. So the disease is causing holes to form in the brain. And normal daily functions the deer begins to forget to do those, like cough. So it, where we would cough and that would prevent phlegm from going into the lungs, the deer's forgetting that. And that's one of the common things it starts to forget earlier uh, when it starts to go clinical, thus the pneumonia formed. And yeah, pneumonia was the listed cause of death. But if it had remembered to cough, it wouldn't have gotten the pneumonia. So when we say CWD, it's not the ultimate, not the proximate cause. It still was the ultimate. The deer wouldn't yeah. have probably got pneumonia without CWD. Thanks for adding that. So uh, it's uh, it's it's basically bottom line, hundred percent fatal because of what happens in the brain. That's that is there's very little doubt about that in the scientific community. Okay, so as we think about common myths and misconceptions. It's hard to not not address uh, folks, leaders in the outdoors community, like I said earlier, like Ted Nugent and Dr. James Kroll and, and some others. I, I've watched a lot of uh, Ted Nugent videos, but here's a, a very, very short segment from Michigan Outdoor Out of Doors podcast. It's from four years ago. Uh, he was extremely unhappy at the time with management efforts in Michigan. Um, he refers to Wisconsin, which he did some research on, but let's watch the video and we'll come back on the other side. Zero sound science to support the banning of feeding and baiting deer. Do you think chronic wasting disease is an issue here? In we're sure it's an issue. Big deal, little deal, are we making too big of a deal of it? It's, we're making too big of a deal of it because there is no sound science that you can show me how prions are caused, it's a mutated protein. I know this stuff, I've been studying it. I've witnessed where CWD has exploded and how Wisconsin implemented certain regulations that didn't mitigate the disease at all. Now they'll tell you that it did, but I've been studying it in the, in the endemic zones of Wisconsin. And there are deer that were collared 18 years ago when CWD is at its peak. And they're still giving birth to fawns. Hmm. So, so there's a lot of science that counters the non-science of our own Michigan Department of Natural Resources. And again, the point is so simple. The deer eat stuff off the ground. It's no different than eating stuff that some family puts on the ground for the deer to eat. There is no correlation between feeding and baiting deer and the spread of any disease, and I stand by that. I've studied with Dr. James Kroll, one of the most preeminent and respected whitetail biologists in the nation. And again, the, every deer on your property, wherever your property may be, every deer licks the same licking branch. 
every deer grooms and licks and kisses and bites and nibbles. So this is, uh, you know, you can watch and you can watch hours of Ted Nugent and you'll see different variations of, of these arguments. And, um, you know, often they're, they're compelling. Uh, this is from four years ago. It's a slight iteration forward where he acknowledges it, you know, it's in some areas it's actually exploding. So that really comes down to how we manage it. We'll get into supplemental feeding in, in a few minutes when we get into actions and whatever, but Bronson, this is no, this is not new to you to to hear these arguments. I've, you probably face it every single day, but what's your immediate reaction to when you hear that? Well, uh, yeah, some of the things <clears throat> I'm going to nitpick a little bit. Uh, deer eat plants. Uh, deer are herbivore, so just to say that deer are eating stuff off the ground, uh, that that that's not entirely true. Um, I think one thing we, we have to point out here, as human beings, we are very bad at accepting bad news. And this bad news for some people is kind of devastating in that it, it requires a change of behavior. And so when MDWFMP is asking for a change in hunter behavior, people don't accept it well. They want to keep doing the way they've always done it and so forth. The other thing, Ricky, that I think is really important is that when we compare CWD and how people react to it versus EHD, we don't see any negative blowback from EHD because the result of an EHD outbreak is immediate and it's tangible. Hunters can see it. They can see the carcasses. They, uh, because they see it, they believe it. Chronic wasting disease isn't over a month. It's not even over a couple years. It's a decade response. And what is very interesting is the region that was just referred to on the video is that when you look at the map provided independently by the USGS, where they are tracking the occurrence of CWD and how it's spreading across the landscape, there's two different management styles in adjacent states. And one of those states has taken a lot uh, more severe action and regarding baiting and feeding, et cetera. And when you look at that map provided by USGS, the results are crystal clear. In terms of what is slowing down the spread, those management actions are working. Might it be painful for some people? Might there also be influencing marketplace decisions? All that's true, all that is in play. But to me, it, it's obvious that some of these management actions are working, but it takes a number of years to see the manifestation of those management actions. So, if, so Bronson, at the time, again, this video was from four years ago. So at the time, it's hard to react to a given situation in terms of actions taken because of the long incubation period and the slow march of CWD that I referred to a few minutes ago, it usually takes years to develop the kind of evidence that you're looking for. That if you're really trying to establish, wow, this action was a best practice compared to this state that didn't take that action, you, it's, it, you might want to react negatively to whatever those actions are in the moment. But to really understand it, you have to wait years. That also adds to the complication of the conversation, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because you don't see a change or a difference that year or the following year. You think nothing's working. But when you look at this over a decade or two decades, there are clear shifts and differences in state agency management styles and actions and results. Yeah. So, William, what would you add to that? I'll give an example that Benton County, Mississippi. Benton County, Mississippi in the early 2000s was one of the most tested counties in the state because we had uh, a processor there. We were gathering samples and we had a processor there that worked real well with us. So, one intentional, it was just by deep, you know, we ended up with a lot of samples. We did not find CWD then. In the past few years, CWD prevalence in bucks in Benton County, just in the past four years, has gone from one in 10 to one in seven, one in six, and this year is one in four. 
So CWD was probably present even back then, but it was at such a small number of deer in the early 2000s, we couldn't find it. But that was when, if we could have found it, we would have had more management options at our disposal. Now with one in 3.7 bucks testing positive, most of the people at hunt in the northern part of that county know somebody that's killed a positive deer. And by the way, this year we found 109 positive deer in the state. Nine of that 109 look sick to the hunters. Yeah. So we ask them that, did the deer look sick? Could you tell anything about it? Uh, three or four of them were skinny, but the others were, well, the deer didn't react to seeing me. I walked up and I was hunting and the deer should have seen me. It did not react. It didn't even react when I shot it. It just stood there and then died a few minutes later. Uh, stuff like that we record in the notes. So, Yeah, yeah. All, all, all valuable. It's interesting. Over time, like when I ran a company, we could make an adjustment in a product or a marketing technique and within a matter of months, we could start to measure, did it make a difference? CWD is not like that. You make a change and it may not, we may not really understand uh, for years. And that makes it so hard. In the meantime, lots of people are reacting <laughs> and it's, and the situation hasn't played itself out yet. We're having a deep dive conversation in the CWD with William McKinley from the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks in Mississippi and uh, Dr. Bronson Strickland from Mississippi State. We'll continue the conversation on the other side. We'll see you after this break. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. We're doing a deep dive into chronic wasting disease today, and we have Dr. Bronson uh, Strickland from Deer University in Mississippi State with us, and William McKinley, who's head of the Deer Program for the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Uh, before I went to break, we looked at a quick little snippet from Ted Nugent and talked about the slowness of the disease, the long incubation period. All these things contribute toward making it a more difficult conversation to have. Um, I found something uh, from from the Ethics of Fair Chase. It was written, written by a guy by the name of Daniel Pedrotti. He's a member of the Boone and Crockett Club. And at this time, this is 10 years ago, the summer of 2014, he was chairman of the Hunter Ethics Subcommittee. And he was responding directly to Ted Nugent on something. I just want to read it to you. Secondly, the conclusion that deer breeding is not statistically related to the incidence and spread of diseases like CWD is cavalier at best. Disease spreading among wild herds has been a fairly constant and consistent discussion among the members of our club and the wildlife biology community for as long as I can remember. While we have not come up with answers yet, the correlation between captive herds and the proliferation of these diseases is irrefutable to most. Brother Ted's dismissal of this idea is too quick, almost like an afterthought, and I found it peculiar for, for such a deep thinker. Okay, so that was, uh, that was 10 years ago that he wrote that. And again, you think about what we were saying before we went to break about the slowness. Once you, once you, once you take an action, the slowness of understanding what was the result of that action, we, you know, the fact that he was able to write this back 10 years ago about the, the uh, irrefutable evidence around deer breeding facilities and transferring deer, um, we know a lot more today about that. And in fact, if I, I give you an, an example, you can go do a search on Texas. The pen to peer, pen transfer in Texas is, is a big deal. And incidentally, why don't we do this? Uh, we when when uh, Bronson was talking about this USGA, USGS map, uh, we're going to put that map back up here again, and um, and we'll we'll kind of refer to that, and then we'll we'll talk within the context of it. For the radio audience, we'll explain what you're what we're looking at. So, Bronson, why don't you kind of share what this map is saying? Well, there's some just some clear associations. Um, if you look and, and color coded there, you'll see in in the gray polygons or the gray areas that is where. CWD is in a free ranging population. And then you'll see either the yellow dots or the red dots are where it has been confirmed in a captive population. And so you can just see very easily the association that's going on there. Now we've got some places you could look at the, the Wisconsin area, the Southern Pennsylvania, you just see the high degree of overlap or the spillover 
where you have CWD found in a lot of captive herds and then in the adjacent surrounding free ranging populations, you also see it there as well. Uh, Texas is interesting though, because you see it more prevalent there. They have tracked it in their captive populations, but yet to find it as frequently in the free ranging populations. And that just may be time. We may 10 years from now, it may look exactly like it does in Wisconsin. So, so time will tell. And William, I may ask you uh, any other insight you have from the map. Well, I would point out that Texas a couple of years ago began using a, a research method of testing called RT Quick, uh, where they're doing some live testing um, and, and other live testing methods. These are not fully USDA approved testing methods and they're not using it to make a management decision. They are, however, kind of using it as a screening and that is allowing them to start picking up a lot more captive positives. Uh, they're only using it in the captive setting. And then if a deer did test positive, that deer would then ultimately be tested and tested with the USDA approved test. So the reason for that Bronson is they may be catching it. They appear to be catching it a lot earlier in that captive setting hopefully before it gets out into a free range setting around it, if it is just confined to the pen there when they find it. So, so Bronson, when you look at that map, again, we're looking at this map, it has some gray areas where you see where uh, testing has resulted in positives. You see the red marks where captive breeding facilities are, and you see a bunch of yellow dots. What are the yellow dots? That is where the, the the captive population has been depopulated. So all the deer within that facility have been removed. Okay. And that's, is that killed? Killed. Yes. Killed. So what you see is, you know, really some aggressive, aggressive, when, when they find it inside the facility, they've been very aggressive to eradicate it. Very similar to what they did with mad, mad cow disease. You know, when you have a, a contained population, you can knock it out and um, and that's really important. But boy, looking at that map, again, a radio audience can go to YouTube and or just go to go search the USGS, USGS map on CWD and you can see the map for yourself or you can go see this show on YouTube or Facebook and uh, see it for yourself. Um, I wanna bring your attention to one other video. There's a lot of videos out there, but of, of one particular video, we posted it at the Super Talk Outdoors Facebook page. You can also get it at YouTube, but it's a conversation between wildlife ecology professor, Dr. Stephen Ditchkoff, Daniel Schmidt of Deer and Deer Hunting Magazine, and Ted Nugent. And it actually happened less than a year ago, which makes it valuable to me. And it's a really good conversation about how to respond and the, the difficulties in response and the differences in responses and whatever. But it does show an evolution of the conversation. If you compare sort of the tone in that video with sort of a tone of a video that came from many years ago, it's very different because the, you can see there's a, uh, there's a lot of acceptance that it's here now. And then the question is, what do we ultimately do about it? So that's, that's important. Um, as, as it relates to James Crawl, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I really want to get to solutions uh, quickly. But James Crawl has said that deer will die something uh, something else before it dies of CWD. He also made some estimates about where it was sort of peak in places like Wisconsin that turned out not to be true. Again, he made those based on his professional judgment. I get it at the time, and I respect. Them. I watch lots of his videos, but it just it just it just evolved a lot faster and more significantly than he expected. Um, any com any comments about any of that, uh, Bronson? Well, he, he's right. He, he is technically correct, but that is the nature of the disease. It, more deer, are, uh, deer with CWD are going to die of these other causes more commonly. But again, that is the nature of this type of disease, a disease that takes two years in some cases, give or take, before you finally reach that clinical air quote here, zombie deer look, that is a deer in the last stages of its life. And so it has months and maybe a year before that where it's predisposed to all sorts of other mortality events. So what he says is technically correct, 
but I think it's a little bit of a misdirection and not reality. And so, William, I, con I on my show regularly talk about Wisconsin as compared to, say, Missouri or Illinois or maybe even Michigan. Um, what was it that happened in Wisconsin that got a lot of people's attention, and how does that contrast with some of these other states? So Wisconsin was the first state to find it east of the Mississippi. First state finding it east of the Mississippi in whitetail deer. And that was in 2001. They did some very extensive testing, uh, found it in not a whole lot of individuals, really kind of where four, four counties come together, a four corners area, uh, very low prevalence. That prevalence has now apparently somewhat leveled off at 60% in bucks, better than a coin flip. If you kill a buck in those four county area there, uh, that it would be positive and about 40% in does. It remains to be seen. So that was just 2002 when, when this began. We're, we're just 22, 23 years later. So a couple of decades. Uh, um, I want to point also at West, at West Virginia. They're doing a just beginning to wrap up a really great study where they put GPS collars on about a hundred deer in each of three different regions of their state. One of those regions was their CWD region. They found CWD in 2005. It was fairly low prevalence, about three or four, maybe 5% in that area. Uh, it's now over 60% in that area in the deer they're sampling. They, they've been watching these deer that they put the collars on for a few years. And CWD in that county is now the leading cause of mortality. It has exceeded hunting mortality in their sample size. These deer were legal for harvest, encouraged to harvest if they were legal. Uh, it has now exceeded, and that's CWD clinical deer have exceeded hunting mortality there. That's scary. Uh, that, is, that is reason for concern. Yeah, it, it really is. We don't want Mississippi to be there, so we want to focus on keeping the prevalence down as much as possible. When we get on the other side, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. We'll see you after this break. Welcome back to the final segment of today's show. We could probably go on for many, many more segments. One one video we're not going to play, but it was a, a video of Joe Rogan or the Joe Rogan experience talking about should you eat deer that has CWD and essentially making the point that um, you know, we this is something we need to be concerned about. Uh, it's not a a uh, human health issue at this point because it has not crossed over like my mild cow disease has, but it could in the future. What you know, Bronson? Shortly, what is your recommendation to people as it relates to testing? Uh, the, the recommendation, as you mentioned, Ricky, there there has been no confirmed case of where it has transferred to human, but. Uh, the science may change. And so the best recommendation right now is to have it tested. Yeah. And if it comes back positive, as the CDC recommends, don't consume that deer. Yeah. So, so that gives you peace of mind and you have zero risk. Anything to add to that, William? No, I, I was going to reiterate the CDC and their recommendations. They strongly consider getting it tested if you hunt in an area with CWD and don't eat it if it comes back positive. Okay, so look, as it relates to how we manage CWD, the biggest, one of the biggest parts of the conversation has been around baiting and supplemental feeding. So let me just get it out there on the table real quick. Uh, I, I personally, for many, many, many years beyond CWD have been in the no baiting camp for a lot of reasons. I just, I just buy into the ethics of hunting in that way, and that's where I am. However, when I do a lot of research on this, I wonder as it relates to CWD management and reducing the herd, might it facilitate the goal of killing more deer if we allowed uh, baiting for a period of time? What's your thoughts about that, William? So Ricky, I'll point out that, you know, I told you earlier, I gathered data. I'll try to estimate how many deer are out there. When we look at the population as a whole, uh, we look at we have a harvest estimate that we gain every year from many of the listeners out there probably participated in this annual survey. It's a telephone survey. Well, our overall success per hunter has been going down for the past uh, roughly decade. At the same time, the amount of feeding and baiting 
and legal legalization of such has been increased, become more liberal. Uh, regulations on it have been removed. So the bottom line, if the goal there was to harvest more deer, I can't say cause and effect. I certainly can. I can't say that more feeding led to less deer getting harvested, but I can say that my numbers are showing we're harvesting less deer per hunter on a statewide basis. Uh, so I would counter with that. I'd also counter with a neighboring state there uh, that banned supplemental feeding in one of their areas, uh, one of their parishes. I don't tell you who it is, Louisiana. And their reporting has shown for the past two years since they banned it due to finding CWD, they've had a record high harvest in that parish uh, for the past two seasons. So once again, I can't say cause and effect, but the argument that we need baiting to harvest more deer, I would say that hunters across the state are not harvesting more deer. So yeah. perhaps they could if they chose to, maybe it's a choice. But uh, I don't have evidence to suggest what you what you bring up there. And so when you come back to, to come over to you, Bronson, when one thing is that a lot of talk about has been how prions have been found on deer feeders and congregating deer together creates more opportunity. I mean, they're going to do nose to nose within families and they're going to do uh, they got their, their rutting activity they do. But then when you bring them together and concentrate them, it just exponentially increases the opportunity they're going to get together. What are, what are you seeing and finding about that? Yeah, well, I think essentially you hit hit the nail on the head is that deer are going to spread the disease. You know, th there is uh, grooming, uh, licking branches. I mean, there are very natural things that deer are going to do to spread the disease, and there's nothing we can do about that. But the things that we can be proactive about are things that at least at this point in time, and I think William would agree, we're going to respond to what the science tells us and that as it evolves. But something that can be proactively done is removing these points on the landscape where deer are concentrated. Also, one of the fluids in a deer where the prions are most concentrated is saliva. Yeah. So obviously, if you're at a baiting or feeding station, you are increasing the likelihood of disease transfer by doing that. So it's just something proactive that can be done. Do you have a sense of how many feeders are in Mississippi? So... Ricky, I'll answer that. MSU's finishing up a study. They just flew several fixed wing transects across the state, thousands of miles of transects, generated a average feeder density per square mile. And it comes out to almost 118,000 feeders in the state when that's extrapolated out. Or if our deer population estimate is right, about a feeder for every 13 deer. So we're talking about a lot of feed on the landscape. It's incredible. Hey, listen, one we, we're out of time, but one area, Bronson, you and I will circle back about. I want to get into more detail about quality deer management. Mississippi is very important to that innovation of that and how it could collide with with CWD. I want to I want to I want to talk more specifically about that. And of course, we're going to continue this conversation. This was not meant to be sort of have it all done in one show. There's no way to do it. There's just too much information out there. But for today, I think we kind of kind of got into it a little bit and showed that we we got have to have open minds and we've got to communicate more and we got to rely on our experts to help us through this this incredible maze god bless you guys and uh, god bless you and stay safe when you're in the outdoors we'll see you next week we're doing a kind of a rare after the show conversation because i really wanted to get uh have a quick conversation about quality deer management and how it could some suggest it could collide with chronic wasting disease, you know, the, the way you go about them. And I, I was asking Bronson to kind of give me his thought on that. Yeah, well, in my opinion, QDM and CWD management are not as misaligned as a lot of people think, because when you get to the fundamentals of QDM, one of the very first things is making sure that your deer herd is that is at an appropriate density relative to your habitat. And William can agree with this. I think William would agree with this. Across the board in Mississippi and the Southeast, most deer herds are way above 
where they should be relative to the naturally occurring food that is supplied. And so that is why we see relatively smaller antlers, smaller body sizes, etc. So at least right now, if you're looking at this from a QDM approach simultaneous to CWD management, lower the deer density, and then you are also going to be improving for the deer that don't have the disease, you are improving the amount of food that is relative to them, and you were gonna see a response in terms of body size and antler size. So I, I, I don't think there's, at least at this point in time, that big of an issue with the two. And uh, William, that, that's my perspective. I'd be happy to hear yours. Well, yes, I'll, I would also like to point out that the best place to aggressively combat CWD is exactly where it is. Now that sounds that sounds too simple, I know, but when we find CWD, what other states are looking at is if they're trying to actually aggressively reduce the density, it is immediately where it is, usually within one or two miles of where it is. And we have taken an approach on that by using what we're calling three mile tags. We will issue landowners within three miles of a known CWD positive. We'll issue them tags to use a gun during archery season. Uh, we have not taken the approach that some states have in sharpshooting around positives. Uh, we have taken this approach and asking our hunters to increase the harvest right there, knowing that in an area that small, and Brunson will agree here, when you remove a lot of deer out of a small area, what happens? Deer from surrounding areas move in as the resources improve. So the goal there of that is to get rid of as many positive deer as possible in a small area and then let the surrounding deer simply move back in before it becomes what we would consider endemic, before these, the, there is enough in the soil that that is impossible. When the prevalence is low, science is showing out there, you can have an impact. Look at what Missouri's doing. Look at what Illinois is doing uh, on that. So you can have an impact if you catch CWD early. Only way to catch CWD early is to test for it aggressively. So we need oh. testing. So I actually I actually uh, get it, what, what you guys are saying about quality deer management and CWD not being conflicting. In fact, they might actually they actually might uh, quite fit well together because if you're talking about, for example, getting a, a doe, buck to doe ratio down to one to two, whatever the whatever the prescription is for a piece of property, it could it could require you in some cases. I can think of some of the land that I lease to reduce the deer herd pretty substantially as it relates to especially does. Uh, where okay, so this is not about conflict, but this is where where CWD is impacting QDM. I, ca I can't help but think about Benton County because I think I think about it a lot. You think about the 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 what they're experiencing and the the increased prevalence in somewhere like Benton, Benton County. If I've got a piece of property in Benton County and I'm really committed to quality deer management, I've gotten my herd down and whatever, but. <laughs> The bucks, I just don't see as many mature bucks anymore. That is absolutely, unfortunately, one of the terrible side effects of CWD with high prevalence, isn't it, uh, uh, William? Well, yes, Ricky, and yes. So we have the choice of trying to manage that herd with CWD or letting CWD manage that herd. And I don't want anywhere else in the state to get prevalence like Benton County has. And I, it's very unfortunate for especially North Benton County. We're getting calls of dead deer on the landscape. They're finding dead heads now as they go out. Uh, I heard that often this past deer season. My goal was to try to prevent other areas from becoming that because there's not a lot of deer living past three years old in that county anymore. That's just what the disease does. It shortens lifespans. So with good quality deer management, with taking care of our herd and keeping density down, and then if testing, uh, providing adequate nutrition, if we do find CWD, aggressively dealing with it early, right there in one small spot on the landscape, that's what other states are showing is working. So it's not a contradiction to QDM. It is actually a, uh, the two, as I agree with Brunson, they merge together well. 
Bronson, we'll close on this point, but um, to me, that's pretty compelling. You know, that we, we want to take, unfortunately, in Mississippi, we have an experience in one county, other counties kind of getting close. We're discovering it, discovering CWD in general in, in new counties. But the reality of something like Benton, where the prevalence is high, where, where the occurrence of positive tests relative to the deer population in Kent, Benton County has increased pretty dramatically over a very short period of time. And then we see what what subsequent impact that has on the older deer. And we're, we're you know, we're, for people who are ethical hunters who are wanting to to get big deer in the wild, I, I had the opportunity to get one on one of my leases this year, 160 inch deer that we had three or four years of experience with. I want my grandkids to have that experience. In order for us to have that experience, we have to take advantage of the best practices that are emerging in other states and just make sure we're implementing them here with the goal to keep the prevalence as low as possible. It, I mean, that's the bottom line. And there's, a, there's growing science and growing evidence from statistics that will help us take what we've learned about Benton County and hopefully make sure that doesn't happen in other counties. That's kind of the bottom line, isn't it, Bronson? Yeah, yeah, I, I think you expressed that perfectly. That is the goal. And I also predict we're going to get more and more efficient at managing for CWD as we learn more and more from science. And so there is currently, as for the past decade, a lot of new research that's going on, a lot of new ways to approach management of the disease. And, you know, my fingers are crossed that over the next five to 10 years, we're going to have breakthroughs and what we can do to manage the disease. Well, that's awesome. And that's a real great positive note to end. Oh, go, William, one thing you wanted to add? Yeah. I'd like to add one plug to that. There is a research project going on practically continent-wide right now called SOP for CWD. Uh, this project is taking management decisions made by states, and we're participating in it, by the way, uh, it's over half, about half the states and a few Canadian provinces. And they're looking at different management techniques, applying that to how it worked in this state versus that. It's, it is that big warehouse where everything is coming in and they can go, okay, well, Arkansas did this, but Mississippi did this. And here's the out. It's not a short-term project, but as Brunson said, when we give it a few more years and we're going to have coming like out of that project showing what worked and what didn't so other states can start applying that to those regions of their state which may not have cwd yet or just finding it the bottom line is that research is ongoing but cwd is just a slow moving beast yeah, so insidious disease as you've discussed it before hey listen there's a there's something great from data I love the fact that we would be doing some common research that tries to get the data points comparable so that we can drive uh, best practices because as we all know, what gets measured gets done. And um, this is this is one time when that's gonna be super important. But in this rare sort of conversation after the show, after the Super Talk Outdoor show here on uh, March the 18th, 2024, uh, I'm glad we had this conversation, and we'll post it on social media and make it available to people so they can see it. It's been it's been a pleasure, my friends. Thank you. you Thanks bet. for the opportunity. Have a have a great day. See you later.